Welcome back to session two on MEG7, Indian English Literature. I'm glad to meet you all once again. Needless to say, it's uh, our second session and I could see close to 13 people who have joined us so far uh, in comparison to the 25 to 30 that we had yesterday. Okay, so as we get the day started, let me reassure those who missed my class yesterday that in terms of the syllabus, in terms of the syllabus that is prescribed for you for MAG7, you have not missed anything per se, because we were discussing an overview of the course. We were discussing how to approach the paper. We were talking about the outlets or avenues of uh, going through your syllabus, your previous year question papers, your assignment questions and so on and so forth. And we were also discovering a few links. So even if you missed my class yesterday, you could say hi to any of your batchmates later today or tomorrow or anytime you feel like. And they may be happy to share with you the resources that we discussed yesterday. Just in case they don't, feel free to contact me as well. Yesterday, I had asked you to fill in your details in a sheet and asked you to initiate a WhatsApp group. Uh, quite interestingly, only three or four people have entered the details. And uh, it seems none of you have initiated the group. So I would request you to do that today. I'll share the link later, a little while later today. So please form a WhatsApp group so that the materials can be shared. You can discuss among yourselves. Uh, pertaining to MEG 7 that is. Okay, so for those who joined today, be happy that there's no portion touched so far. We'll begin today and then we have four more or three more sessions left this week. So there are seven or eight more hours left from this particular point onwards. Okay, so let's get started with and uh, as we get started with, let me also ask you for those who came yesterday. Some of you were quite keen to know what I would be dealing with today. And uh, I did tell you that, you know, come with a blank slate of mind. But then did you go back to any of your blogs? Did you read something yesterday or today? Did you get time to go through something? Prose, poetry, something? The reason why I asked you to come with a blank state of mind is uh, I could begin from anywhere. As far as this MEG7 sessions are concerned, I told you yesterday itself, academic counseling sessions are not actually meant to be lecturing sessions. Uh, they are supposed to be doubt clearance sessions. But because most of our learners are in a way limited in terms of hands-on experience or limited to lectures, um, they request us to deal with a few portions. So, at times we end up lecturing a little bit here and there, but ideally, as far as the conceptualization goes, academic counselors are not lecturers. They are not called professors. They are not called lecturers. That's why we are called academic counselors. We are here for doubt clearance. But despite that, we know that because we only have a few sessions, we have to deal with some pieces or the other with an examination perspective in mind. So when that be kept in mind, there is one thing I forgot to mention yesterday. I was taking you on a tour of the assignment questions, previous year question papers, the syllabus and so on and so forth. But one thing I forgot to tell you is, apart from the fact that the first part of your question paper contains annotations, another thing that you may find slightly problematic with MEG7, also with the paper American Literature, I think it's MEG6, if you have opted for that paper, MEG6. These two papers have a specific complexity which some learners may find to be problematic. For instance, if you ask me about my preferences in terms of genres, I am a person who is extremely fond of drama. The moment you say there's a play in the uh, syllabus, I'll be excited. I don't mind reading short stories and novels. But generally, when it comes to poetry, or let's say when it comes to some other genres, I may not be as comfortable dealing with them as I deal with, say, poetry or no, as I deal with novel or drama. So the problem with MEG 7 and MEG 6 is that being a paper that encompasses an entire literature, Actually, the title is a misnomer. 
it is actually not indian english literature or american literature if you go to the current mg university ma syllabus you would see that the same paper with different text that is is titled as american literatures and indian english literatures because over the last decade or so we the academia have come to acknowledge this multiplicity of voices and the reciprocity of the literatures that we come across so we don't speak about a monotonous voice we do not speak about a unitary literature rather we look at it we look at that from a broader perspective and we call them literatures so from that purview because the paper deals with indian english literature it cuts across all sorts of genres you may remember the syllabus that i showed to you yesterday there are novels there are plays there are short stories there are poems there is non fictional prose so there is quite a lot of genres coming all together over the eight blocks that's prescribed for you which means in that sense it's slightly complicated for instance you will have to read the blocks of read all the uh, units in block 7 poetry with the aim of appearing for the first section that is annotation you may have to read midnight children or kantapura or clear the day of the light and uh, other prose works with the view of writing an essay so the preparation and the reading and the mental uh, effort that you put into it varies based on the genre say for instance if you prepare for uh, i mean it's not enough but i'm just saying it for the sake of saying it let's say you are preparing for kantapura merely preparing for that by looking at a summary on the web can still help you to clear your exams but then if you have to prepare uh, from block 7 let's say a poetical piece then maybe you will have to go extensively into that poem read it twice thrice quadruple times and then analyze it look at the various facets of it and then dig deep and also remember those lines so that the moment it comes into the question paper you could recollect okay this is from this particular stanza this particular poem written by this particular writer so that's how the genres would confuse you sometimes or would create a sort of a question mark i personally would struggle to memorize the lines from poetry i may still be able to write what a poem means or intends but then to remember the lines and then write it down to the uh, answer sheets could be difficult for me a learner like me and i acknowledge that most some at least some of you would have same problems some people would have the same problem with plays some would have it with novels so that is a problem that indian english literature presents so when i ask you not to read something uh, beforehand for today's session that's more because we are going to get into an engaging session today. and i was slightly confused between two genres for today i was confused as to where to begin from i could begin with short stories i could begin with novels i could get started with poetry there are quite a lot of options in that paper and mind you we only have five sessions and today is the second one so uh, dr prema has promised that we'll be having extended sessions next week but then i'm not so sure about that so as far as considering the worst case scenario providing we have only sessions this week then it becomes a challenge for me to gauge between these genres with quite a lot of works to pick from what to teach and what not to teach or what to discuss and what not to discuss so amidst this problem i told you yesterday not to go back and look or refer anything but then as a general suggestion i would ask you to go read all the prose works prescribed for you especially the novels clear the light of the anita desai uh, untouchable mulk rajanand uh midnight children salman rushdie and so on because as and when we get time in an hour not in two hours but then quickly in 45 to 60 minutes we'll deal with these words when i started today's class with midnight children i'm sure most of you would have thought today we are going to deal with it no we are not we're not doing it because rushdie needs some sort of a pitch before i start rushdie rushdie is one of the most complex novelists that india have ever seen so we'll come to that a little while later also the dilemma is between essays and annotations 
So there were a few learners who had WhatsApp me yesterday asking me about the complexities of attempting the annotations and asking me how to memorize and get the uh, questions from poetry correct. So then I thought we'll begin with poetry. Generally, poetry is about invoking the muse. We, we invoke the muses. We sort of get into a solemn prayer and then we get started with poetry. That's how the Greeks used to do. So I thought let's begin with poetry and uh, let's see where we can uh, progress from there in this week. Tomorrow, hopefully, I'll move to prose and uh, use poetry as a fit gap arrangement. Let's say if I speak about Rushdi for an hour and a half or quarter, for the remaining 30 to 35 minutes, I'll try to rush through one poem here and there. And as far as poems are concerned, it's better that you come with a blank slate of mind. Do not come prepared. Even the same applies for the novels, but then if you just go through some summary or the blocks that would help you to maybe form certain questions or maybe correct me if at all I go wrong some. So that's why it would be recommended. Without much ado, let's get the day started. We have an interesting writer to deal with today. And uh, I, as I told you, I don't want the lecture to be monotonous. I'm not intending to speak for the next, say, 75 to 90 minutes because then it becomes boring. Already, I can't see if you are listening to me or not. I've told this yesterday itself. You may be traveling, you may be in your kitchen, you may be doing some other business, and you may be just hearing me rather than listening. So, so I don't want to have such a futile exercise, but rather these sessions would become a lot more interesting the moment this becomes interaction. So let's get the day started with a poet, that people from R.C. Cochin or people from Kerala are quite familiar with. She is known in various names, unlike many other writers who have only one name or a pen name, perhaps two names there, but then a nomenclature. But here, this particular author has three, or she's known by three names. She is called Kamala Das. She is called Kamala Suraya. She is also called Madhavi Kuti. The Malayalis, in particular would easily be able to relate to her and for those from the north would have still learned her during your bachelor's or maybe during your school days in one form or the other. So because she is a Malayali writer and we have quite a lot of Keralaites out here, let's get the day started with what you know about Kamala Das. Come on, let's show it to the world. There are quite a lot of pan-Indian audience out here. Let's see what the Malayalis know about Kamala Das before I try to you know, bring all those together and give you an overview on Kamala Das. If you would mind unmuting yourself, there is no right and wrong answers here. You can feel free to express yourself. And mind you, you won't get any other space like this where you could just unleash yourself. So feel free to open up. Kamala Das, Adhavamadavi Kutte Kurcha, Ninga Kariya Onda Gairingal, Onda Nyanglamai, Shari Ya. I've uh, learned three poems of hers. So from that, when you read the poem, uh, what I felt is the expression of being a woman, woman, or uh, how she portrays a woman. It is something that gives you happiness. It gives you, you are happy, you give you, as a woman maybe, I feel that. Uh, mm -hmm. You are, is, there are some writers who's writing when you read, you you, fe you feel that you are misportrayed, you have not uh, expressed properly or how, the way, oh, this is not how a woman behaves. Sometimes you feel that, but you read uh, Kamala Suraya's poems or work as such, you feel, mm -hmm. wow, that's how a woman is and that's how she should be written about. It's just one aspect of it, it's just one. Okay. Good. Anybody else would like to add to that? Yes, Dilip Ji, please go on. Mr. Dilip, I can see that your hands are raised. Are you there? Mr. Dilip? Hello, yeah. Yes, please, go on. Can you hear me? So one thing about uh, uh, Kamala Das is that uh, her writings has got uh, very much uh, kind of uh, 
very openly speaking about the restrictions imposed on women that is something which i have also heard about okay great uh, tarun i can see your hands raised as well tarun ja uh, yes uh, kamla das uh, yeah, uh, she is a feminist basically and uh, she has written three uh, in our syllabus there are three poems uh, the uh, introduct and introduction and uh, there are others uh, grandmother's love and like my uh, old grandmother like so my grandmother uh, yeah. yeah these these are uh, the poems taken from uh, summer in Cal uh, calcutta so yes she has written these uh, uh, poems and uh, in these uh, she are she is uh, uh talking about uh, that uh, what she wanted in her life and uh, she it's a semi autobiographical in a way and uh, so in this poem she uh, talks about uh, the things like uh, she wanted uh, some uh, but she could not get what uh, whatever and uh, uh, so and uh, so these things uh, in said she is mentioned like uh, problems she get got and uh, uh, in her life so that much okay great thank you tarun thank you would anybody else like to add to it any personal details biographical details that you are familiar with that you would like to share anyone else Okay, I could see two hands raised. Let me go back to Shreya once again. Yes, Shreya. Uh, I just wanted to add one more thing to that. Uh, I started. I first read her poem when I was in twelfth. So, as a young adolescent who is growing up, her poems kind of give you a permission. It's not that time you feel as if it's a permission that it's okay to feel things. It's okay uh, to express yourself. Uh, it's more like now I know it is kind. It is somewhat in the lines of liberalization. so she gives a kind of encouragement for that uh you get that from her while reading her works yeah i just okay. want to add that noted noted good one dilip ji mr dilip uh no i didn't uh, raise the hand it was actually previously done yeah okay okay fine thank you okay. Right. Anyone else would like to add something? Any biographical details? Any personal references from Kamala Das that comes to your mind when we discuss all these things? All right, doesn't matter. So let me. Okay, I think Tarun has again raised his hand. Yes, Tarun. Yes. Yeah, nice. uh she was married at a young age i think uh, at 16 years and uh, so at that age she was not mentally prepared uh, nobody is prepared at that uh, young age for marriage so and these things so uh, that is that i understand thank you so a, a basic understanding of kamla das personal life would help you understand and appreciate her poems better i am aware that from from my interactions yesterday i am aware that most of you have gone through the blocks and have attempted your assignment questions so that accounts like some just a while ago i think tarun was speaking about the three poems so that's because you have gone through the blocks you are familiar with the titles you know what exactly goes in that poem and that's why i told you i would rather not depend on a stereotypical lecture but rather bring certain things into your perspective So talking about Kamala Das she was born into a famous or rather prestigious family here in Kerala called the Nalapat Tarawar so the Nalapat family is what she belonged to and uh, her father Nalapat Narayana Menon and her mother Balamani Amma were two prominent writers in Malayalam she belonged to a literary family just like Virginia Woolf for instance despite the social differences despite uh, you know the uh, uh, gender politics and other stuff going on 
despite the restrictions. People who are born into a literary family or a political family or an affluent family enjoy this privilege of getting a better opportunity to voice themselves. So Kamala Das, or Madhavikuti for that sake, being born in the Nalapat family, had that privilege of slightly bypassing those gender disorders, uh, sorry, gender discriminations, and express herself because her mother herself, sorry, her grandmother herself, Balamaniyama herself, was a, an accomplished writer back then. Uh, so from that context, she grew up at a very literary family. Her, her house was slight, was kind of a, a miniature library. She was born and brought up amidst a pile of books. She, re, she was a voracious reader. She also had it in her genes to get into writing. And uh, uh, like Tarun pointed out, at a very young age, she got married to another Malayali, uh, an extremely elderly person to her, and his name was Das. That's why it is Kamala Das. So Kamala gets married to Das at a very young age, and uh, there was definitely a marital discord between her and her husband. Apart, to make that worse, uh, because Das was from Calcutta, he worked in Calcutta, Kamala had to leave her heritage home in Kerala, in Nalapat, and migrate to Calcutta. So her experiences in Calcutta becomes the crux of most of her poems. Uh, somebody mentioned the name of the collection, Summer in Calcutta, which is her first poetry collection in English. So if you read Summer in Calcutta, most of the works narrate her experiences in Calcutta. Maybe domestic problems between her and her husband, maybe her personal feelings, maybe her nostalgic longings about her, her Nalapat house in Kerala, her attempts to go back to uh, Kerala, and so on and so forth. Uh, some of you might have read this poem, The Bangle Sellers, during your school days, that deals with, or a hot noon in Malabar, for instance. So these are poems where she recounts how uh things were when she was a child in kerala and how things are different in calcutta so she she draws these inevitable comparisons between uh the place where she has migrated and what is her hometown so amidst a wide range of such comparisons you could see her poems developing her personal experiences could indeed be seen in her poems you could see, uh, apart from this nostalgic longing and representations of Calcutta, you could see representations of marriage, marital discord. And when that comes up, you could see the political patriarchal references, women empowerment. So uh, gender-based themes, all are, in preg are pregnant and uh, abound in her writings. You could see that Kamala Das dwells deep into this uh, problems that she faces as a woman, as a wife, as someone who is longing for love, who is longing for homeland. So all this comes uh, and becomes part of her poems. Along with this, a mention must also be made to a particular term. Most of her poems were personal and writing poems which are based on one's thoughts or feelings or experiences in canonical terms are called dash. I give you examples, poems written by Emily Dickens, poems written by Sylvia Plath. They all belong to a particular ship. Confessional poetry? Yes. Confessional poetry? Yes, confessional poetry, spot on. Just give me a second, yes. We have class today. Just give me a second. Somebody is unable to sh log into our class. This is the link. Please join as I Yep. Sorry for the uh, delay. Um, I was trying to tell you, yes, that's called confessional poetry. So Kamala Das poems could also be termed as confessional poetry. There is one thing I forgot to correct in terms of your pronunciation, most of your pronunciation, not only today, but yesterday also. Uh, the word P-O-A-E-M, P-O-E-M, 
it is i uh, indianized english that we call them as poem but its pronunciation is po it's po it's not poem it's not poem it's not poem it's po it's totally fine for you to express it as poem here because this is a place that i told you i i see this as a training ground for you you can unleash yourself but the moment you clear your post graduation and you go somewhere and try to become teachers what you utter is equally important so i'd like to caution you against that pronunciation but yes so when it comes to the poems of kamla das you could see these many themes foreground gender based personal or confessional in tone political patriarchal women empowerment dealing with the locales of calcutta versus kerala nostalgic longings marriage das was not a cruel man but the age difference had actually made a huge a wide gulf between kamala and das and uh, she struggled a lot because of that so before we get started with her poem like tarun said there are three poems prescribed i can't promise that i'll deal with all the three but maybe i'll try to deal with two for your convenience and uh, before we get started with that let me also very quickly discuss with you about this particular term called indian english literature we had partially discussed this yesterday more often than not indian english in comparison to other literatures is considered to be a degradable one I'm trying to tell you that uh, yeah when it comes to indian english literature there is this particular deteriorative view that people have regarding the indian english uh, literature as such or writing in indian english so when it comes to that it is also because english is not a primary language but mind you the same is the case with so many other post colonial countries so we generally speak about british english as a standard english variety then we speak about american english even canadian and australian english is okay but then we speak about the other english literatures as others we speak about african literatures caribbean literatures indian literatures in a derogatory tone so when it comes to indian english literature this pretext is something that most of the indian writers found to be a little bit upsetting if you go to the block on midnight children you would come across in the first unit you would come across a discussion in this uh, part well i'm not going to deal with it right now but then just to give you a reference i suppose it is in unit 2 uh, you have a reference where the block talks to you about how writers like mulkaraj anand rk narayan and all used english so what was until then that is until 1940s or 1950s considered to be other other because we are indians it is an alien tongue to us english is an alien tongue to us from 1940 onwards rk narayan mulkaraj anand raja rao they all started to conceive english as our own because for more than 100 years being a colony we were using english so during the 1940s during the 1940s these writers these trio of uh, mulkaraj anand uh, rk narayan and uh, um, raja rao they started to look at in english literature as not an inferior thing but as one of the languages that we use so disregarding certain common attributes of english so they started to use it in an indianized way and they started to celebrate that indianized way we'll come to that later when we discuss untouchable or uh, kantapura or uh, midnight children but for the time being as a part of beginning i'd like to bring to your notice that they used uh, this uh, indian english in that manner then anita desai came i'm talking about novels for the time being. so anita desai came and after anita desai during the 1970s there were a kind of void there were no major writers or major writing styles in indian english that came forth and then came salman rushdie in 1981 followed by arundhati roy and amitav ghosh a few years later 
and that is where indian english in a way became more prominent in terms of comparison but whenever as an indian you attempt to write in english you surface uh, a lot of humiliations so kamala das despite being formed to a, despite being born to a well known malayalam fa malayali family uh, whenever she attempted to write in english the critics didn't spare her because of her language and that's where the first poem prescribed poem prescribed for your study comes from the poem is titled an introduction more often than not you will find that title in the beginning of a work as a preface but here an introduction is basically the title of the poem for the ease of reading i'm sharing it to your chat box i'm sharing a link of that poem i'll share my screen and i would request you to attempt a read or two or three for that sake don't worry i'm not going to ask you to read all the 60 lines at a stretch maybe we can divide it into 15 lines each and maybe four people can read it that will be that will be better because you get an opportunity to recite a poem which being a distant learner you may otherwise not get an opportunity to i hope my screen is visible just in case my screen is not visible you could uh, refer the link that i have shared to you and i request you to take turns and read the poem aloud unmute yourself and recite the poem for us we'll slowly try to get into that poem but just recite that poem for all of us who will begin oh come on i i really wish all of you are there i could see almost 25 people out here okay arya great please get started with and dilip sir i request you to please put your hands down because i i often get misled that you want to do something okay great thank you if you want to speak up please put your hands up that's fine okay arya please get this started for us yes sir so how many lines shall i read 15 lines so that okay. we can divide it between four people all right I don't know politics, but I know the names of those in power and can repeat them like days of week or names of months beginning with Nehru. I am Indian, very brown, born in Malabar. I speak three languages, write in two, dream in one. Don't write in English, they said. English is not your mother tongue. Why not leave me alone? Critics, friends. Visiting cousins, every one of you, why not let me speak in any language I like? The language I speak becomes mine. Its distortions, its queriness, <coughs> all mine, mine alone. It is thank half you, English. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That'll do, that'll do. Thank you, thank you, that'll do. Because there is a full stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Anyone else would like to take it from there? We we'll come back to these lines a little while later. Yep, I could see two hands up. So maybe we'll take turns. Let's get started with Sangeeta ji and Ruby ji. You can do it after this. Okay. So Sangeeta ji, go on. Sangeeta ji, I didn't unmute, sir. All mine, mine alone. It is half English, half Indian. Funny perhaps, but it is honest. It is as human as I am human. Don't you see? It voices my joys, my longings, my hopes. And it is useful to me at, as cowing is to crows or roaring to the lions. It is human speech, the speech of the mind that is here and not there. A mind that sees and hears and is aware, not the deaf, blind speech of trees and storm or of monsoon clouds or of rain or the incoherent mutterings of the blazing funeral pyre. I was child and later they told me I grew, for I became tall, my limbs swelled and one or two places sprouted hair. 
मैन आई आस्क फॉर लव थैंक यू थैंक यू थैंक यू संगीता जी ओके सर ओके सर नेक्स्ट पर्सन प्लीज मे स्टार्ट सर यस प्लीज ha huh. when i asked for love not knowing what else to ask for he drew a youth youth of 16 into the bedroom and closed the door he did not beat me but my sad woman body felt so beaten the weight of my breasts and womb crushed me i shrank pitifully then i wore a shirt and my brother's trousers cut my hair short and ignored my womanliness dress in sarees be girl be wife they said be embroiderer be cook be a quarreler with servants fit in oh belong cried the categorizers don't sit on walls or peep in through our lace draped windows be army or be kamala or better still be madhavi kutti thank you thank you ruby ji it is time army okay. her, she, she was called as army <coughs> so during her childhood days she was addressed as army that was a pet name so that's amy army okay thank you bhavana ji would you like to take it from there yes sir please it is yeah so please uh, yeah. yeah it is time to choose a name a role keep trending games Don't play at schizophrenia or be a nympho. Cry embarrassingly loud when jilted in love. I met a man, loved him, call him not by any name. He is every man who wants a woman. Just as I am every woman who seeks love in him, the hungry taste of rivers in me, the ocean standing is waiting. Who are you? I ask each and every one the answer is it is I anywhere and everywhere I see the one who is I in this world he is tightly packed like the sword in his teeth okay, it is thank you bhavana ji thank you thank you who is going to lead read the last part may i sir yes please go on it is surinder ji yes thank you sir it is i who drink lonely drinks at 12 midnight in hotels of strange towns it is i who laugh it is i who take who make love and then feel shame it is i who die who lie dying with a rattle in my throat i am sinner i am sent i am the beloved and the betrayed i have no joys which are not yours no aches which are not yours i too call myself i great thank you so much all of you for your cooperation that was really wonderful a good start to say the least and uh, there is a specific reason why i made you read these 60 lines there are actually more than one reason Uh, as you all know you have annotations and you have if you have to remember the lines you have to try practicing reciting them so that's one of the primary reasons why i wanted you to uh, read this on the first place but apart from that i also wanted to see how you are going to attempt these 60 lines even though you read them in parts i wanted to see how you would read these 60 lines today before getting started with with this poem i spoke to you about the reference in midnight children's block 2 where i told you that uh, up until the three writers the three novelists uh, indian english was seen as something inferior and english was seen to be something elitist and uh, these three writers broke down the shackles and brought in an indian musicality to their writings again i can give you two cross references if you if you if you uh, have opted for mg14 which i believe belongs to this cluster you would come across this poem by nisi mesikel called the patriot most of you would have studied another poem by sikel titled goodbye party for miss pushpa ts so if you if you remember learning these poems or if and when you read this poems you would realize that they are all indianisms an indianized way of speaking 
is being uh, employed in writing these poems. So the moment you read a poem by Kamala Das, where she speaks about her dilemma as a poet, which later shifts into a lot of personal queries and gender equations, I agree. But at least in the beginning part, I know you didn't do that probably because either your language is good or you understand that Kamala Das spoke really well. But maybe think from a normal Indian perspective and try reciting this poem. There are two ways in which you could recite this poem. I'm not saying that one is right and the other is wrong, but one is Anglican, the second one is Indian. And when you read Indian English literature, you should be aware of that indigenous variety as well. You could just go on and uh, read this poem like this. I don't know politics, but I know the names of those of power and can repeat them like days of week or names of months beginning with Nehru. I'm Indian, very brown, born in Malabar. I speak three languages, write in two, dream in one. You could do that. But just imagine reading this, just give that the voice, just give it the tone and try to own them like you do in terms of a, of a dialogue in a play. Just try reading that poem up until here, giving it the voice of an Indian. And then these words would make sense to you. I don't know politics, but I know the names of those in power. Power, yeah, of those in power. And can repeat them like days of week or names of months, beginning with Nehru. Okay, we'll come to the gender politics later. That's a more significant thing, but we'll come back to that later. I am Indian, very brown, born in Malabar. We speak with this hyphenated English, right? So I am an Indian, very brown, born in Malabar. I speak three languages. You know, that's that, that is, is from Malayalam. I speak three languages. Write in two, write in two, dream in one. Don't write in English. They said, English is not your mother tongue. Why not leave me alone, critics, friends, visiting cousins, every one of you? Why not let me speak in any language I like? The language I speak becomes mine. Its distortions, its queerness, all mine, mine alone. Right? The queerness, queerness means strangeness. If I speak the way I speak right now, that's my English. That's the way I speak English. What's your problem with it? You speak a standard English. Who's stopping you from that? Right? I speak the as the or the or I, I say language. What's the problem with you? It is half English, half Indian, funny perhaps. Right? If you speak British English, it's funny. But when I say it, I'd say funny, perhaps, perhaps, but it is honest, honest, it is honest, it is as human as I am human, don't you see, it voices my joys, my longings, my hopes, and it is useful to me as carving is to crows or roaring to the lions, it is human speech, the speech of the mind that is here and not there. A mind that sees and hears and is aware. Not the deaf blind speech of trees in storm or of monsoon clouds or of rain or the incoherent mutterings of the blazing funeral pyre. So see how she employs language. The first three lines actually has some other politics. We'll come to that a little while later. But look from the fourth line onwards. How are we defined? We are defined based on our language, the way we look, our appearances, our color, and so on and so forth. So see how she brings in those stereotypes. I am an Indian, very brown. See, black versus brown and she chooses brown, okay? So I am an Indian, very brown, deep brown. I'm from Malabar. Malabar is in the southern coast of India. So at the end of India, I'm in Malabar. I'm from Malabar. I speak three languages. Write in two and dream in one. I speak three languages. I speak four to five languages. I know Malayalam, Hindi, English, Tamil, Telugu. So Kamala Das says she knows three languages. Of which she knows to write in two. Right? So I speak three languages, write in two, 
and dream in one see how she brings in that mother tongue quotient into a glorified portion i dream in one how else can we dream if not in our mother tongue often for annotation these two lines are asked i speak three languages write in two dream in one a post-colonial conundrum cannot be explained in a better uh, cannot be put in a better versification i speak three languages write in two and dream in one why are you bothered about the english that i come up with so a point to be noted there so she speaks about her writings so don't write in english they said english is not your mother tongue don't write in english they said who are this they again we'll come to that a little while later so don't write in english they are not i mean this day is not defined anywhere in the poem we can only make mute speculations but then in a larger context that could still be valid so we'll come to that a little while later sorry don't write in english they said english is not your mother tongue so in order to say in order to forbid her from writing in english they asked they, they pointed out a valid reason that your mother tongue is not english i have already given you that background she was born to a well known malayalam fa malayali family both her grandparents and parents were writers so as someone who belongs to a family of writers balamani amma notably is a well known malayalam poetess so from a family where people write in malayalam why do you want to write in english is a question that people threw at kamala das don't write in english they said english is not your mother tongue why not leave me alone so she asked them why not leave me alone so who are this day there are some there is there is quite a lot of broader explanations but maybe connecting these three lines critics friends visiting cousins and everyone in the world please leave me alone let me write in whatever language that i'm comfortable with i write it too that is i write in malayalam i write in english but if i'm comfortable let me write in english what's your problem with that why not let me speak in any language i like the language i speak becomes mine whichever language i speak this mine it has my own attributes it's like my baby it may have its distortions it may have its queerness but they are all mine mine alone you may ridicule that by saying it's half english half indian you may find it to be funny but it is honest it is as human as i am human don't you see this is what she asks needless to say every language is about expressing ourselves so however broken or fragmented or funny you may find an indian language in english she says that it is an embodiment of me my emotions my feelings my expressions why are you not able to see that and if i am getting some sort of a satisfaction by expressing myself wholesomely why should it irk you is something that kamla das wants to know so she says the language i speak becomes mine with all its flaws its distortions its queerness it's mine alone you may call it as half english half indian funny but the intention is honest why because it voices my joys my longings my hopes and it is useful to me as carving is to crows or roaring to the lions it is human speech the speech of the mind that is here and not there a mind that sees and hears and is aware again a possible annotation so what does my versification do to me when i write poems in english it is a means of expressing my joys 
like someone said, her poems are full of happiness. Not entirely, but then there are some poems which are full of happiness, celebration. So it voices my joys. It voices my hopes. Even when I am at the dark end of a tunnel, my poems give me hope to proceed further, to combat these issues. It is useful to me as cowing is to crows or roaring is to lions or let's say as breathing is to all living beings. Like a duckling to water. I try. That's totally okay, Savidaji. You may feel free to me. So as roaring is to lions or as cowing is to crows, it's part of my living. It's like human speech. The speech of the mind that is here and not there. A mind that sees and hears and is aware. Now again, look at the construction that Kamala Das seeks. For me, my writing is like human speech. It's like roaring to lions. The speech of the mind. right? The mind conceptualizes and that conceptualized abstract thing is put into words, thereby concretizing it. So the abstract ideas are put into words and they form my poems. So the speech of the mind that is here and not there, right? That is here, that is here in the paper, that has been written down. It's not lost. That's not lost in my mind. That's put into ideas. That's put into words. That is not abstract, not vague, but very concrete. So that's here and not there. A mind that sees and hears and is aware. That last word is very important. The mind that sees and hears. Right? What actually sees and hears? It's the physical. It's the body. It is the organs. It's the eyes that sees and it's the ears that hears. But for Madhavikuti, it is the mind that sees and hears and is aware of what goes around me. Yes, the mind that can perceptualize whatever is going around, is aware of what's going around, knows the good and bad, knows how to respond, knows the need to keep kicking. Not the deaf blind speech of trees and storm or monsoon clouds or the rain of the incurrent mutterings of the blazing funeral pyre. I was child and later they told me I grew. Okay, so before we proceed any further, let me go back to the first few lines. So now the poem takes a gender turn from a personal literary quest. The poem takes a gender turn, which was there in the beginning. She says, I don't know politics, but I know the names of those in power and can repeat them like days of week or names of months, beginning with Nehru. Here, it's not about a glorification of Indian National Congress or Jawaharlal Nehru or anything, but rather Nehru as a representational name, as an embodiment of power and privilege invested in men. It could be anybody else. It could be EMS. It could be Penrai Vijin. It could be anybody for that sake. So she says, I am not fond of politics. I I'm someone who doesn't want to get involved in politics. I know nothing about politics, any politics in the ABCD, Aryatilla. But then I know a few names like Nehru. So she's, while she says she doesn't know anything about politics or does not want to get involved in politics, she tries to bring into context the statement called personal is political. And political is privilege. Privilege is power. And that privilege, power, politics is in the hands of men. It's patriarchal. And women are targeted. That is the vision that Kamala Das tries to bring forth. So she says, I don't know politics, but I know the names of those in power and can repeat them like days of week or names of months beginning with Nehru. Then she goes on and at a later point of time she says, don't write in English, they said. This they could very well be her critics, friends, cousins, or anybody. But that they could also mean patriarchal men who try to look at her as a women writer and try to shame her or abuse her. 
more often than not, a lot of women have noted the struggles of becoming writers in a male dominant world. So Kamala Das tries to bring in that. And as we get to this latter part, we could see how she was conditioned to a certain extent. I was child and later they told me I grew for I became tall, my limbs swelled and one or two places sprouted hair. When I asked for love, not knowing what else to ask for, he drew a youth of 16 into the bedroom and closed the door. He did not beat me, but my sad woman body felt so beat. The weight of my breasts and womb crushed me. I shrank pitifully. In just about eight to nine lines, she sums up the plight of a miserable adolescent girl into a woman. This is a common story that most of us are familiar with. For the Malayalis out there, I can give you two movie references. One is that movie Jai 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 Hai, starring Basil Joseph and Darshana Rajendra, which exactly deals with the same story. From the moment you attain puberty, there are a lot of do's and don'ts that come from the family. You can't go out with friends, you can't climb the trees. During the periods you have to sit out, maybe you can't go to the temple, you can't eat this, you can eat that, you have to get married. So all this sort of conditioning forms the crux of that movie. So Madhavi Kuti tries to kind of bring in that conditioning pattern. I was a child, but later they told me I grew. So she tries to say that by, uh, from my mind, I still have a lot of fantasies that I nurtured as a child. I still have that kid in me, but then they killed it because my body grew. I became tall, my limbs swelled and one or two places sprouted hair. When I asked for love, you know, that's what you ask as adolescents. It's not about sex, it's about love, it's about affection, it's about care. So when I asked for love, not knowing what else to ask for, he draw a youth of 16 into the bedroom and close the door. Just like the age old black and white movies, you know what happens when a girl is taken to a bedroom and the door is closed. Again, I get reminded of a Malayalam movie by TV Chandra starring Meera Jasmine. Padam Onna Urivilaba. If you haven't seen that movie, I would recommend you to watch that movie. Padam Onna Urivilaba. I'm sorry, I missed that word. Padam Onna Urivilaba. Chapter 1, a yelling, or a wailing, cry, outcry. So uh, in that movie, we can see that... Uh, a teenage girl like this has been drawn into marriage, was drawn into room, and literally marital rape is what takes place. So Kamala Das tries to defend Das. She, she says uh, he did not beat me. He was not that cruel, though he was forceful at me. He, he did not beat me. But my sad woman body felt so beaten. The weight of my breasts and womb crushed me. I shrank pitifully. I was forced to rather perform a biological function of that of a wife. I had to play a wife's role forcefully. So see how the poem quickly changes the mood from writing to domestic roles. Now look at another sudden shift in the poem's uh, stories. Then I wore a shirt and my brother's trousers, cut my hair short and ignored my womanliness. We see that in a lot of radical feminists for that sake. So fed up by this stereotyping gender uh, roles and the, the forced uh, conceptions over me, I wore a shirt and cut my hair and I wore my brother's trousers and ignored my womanliness. Dress in saris. Be girl, be wife, they said. Be embroiderer, be cook. Be a quarreler with servants. Fit in. Oh, belong, cried the categorizers. Don't sit on walls or peep in through our face-draped windows. 
right? So that's how conditioning happens. Dress in sari. Women have legs is a movement that happened a few years ago because of the stereotyping in dressing, right? So don't dress in short skirts, don't dress like this, don't dress like that. So dress in sari. Be girl, be wife, be embroider, be cook, be that servant to your husband, do the domestic roles. Fit in, that's a conditioning word, fit in, cried the categorizers. Don't sit on walls or peep in or don't go out and play with your friends. Yep, condition. So be Ami or be Kamala or better still be Madhavi Kuti. It's time to choose a name, a role. Don't play pretending games. Don't play at schizophrenia or be a nympho. Don't cry embarrassingly loud when jilted in love. So what happens there? This is what happens when a woman or a girl goes through such trauma and starts to become rebellious. The patriarchs accuse her to be schizophrenic, accuse her to be wayward, accuse, accuse her to be um, playing games, mind games that is. So she says, these are things that she went through. Don't play pretending games. Don't play at schizophrenia or be a nympho. Don't cry embarrassingly loud when jilted in love. Then she goes on to speak about another twist. I met a man, loved him. Call him not by any name, he is every man. Right? A man is every man. He is not individual, he is a type. He is a stereotype. The moment you say man, all men are going to be like this is a sort of categorization that Madhavi Kuti brings in. He is every man who wants a woman. Just as I am every woman who seeks love. So just as I am looking for love, I met a man who like any other man wants a woman. And mind you, again, this is the contest between mind and body. I look for love and I met a person who, like any other person, was looking for the physical pleasures. In him, the hungry haste or of reverse, in him, the hungry haste of reverse, in me, the ocean's tireless waiting. So I am calm and I am looking for love. In him, the hungry haste, the hunger of lust. Who are you? I ask each and every one. The answer is, it is I. I hope the Malayalis would remember this famous dialogue by Kudravattam Pappu. Right? The epistemological question or the existential question that all of us face. The question faced by Buddha and Christ alike. Who are you? Who am I? Where am I heading to? Is it this mortal, immortal world or is it the other world that I belong to? So, um, yeah, so she asks them, who are you? And the answer is, it is I. Here that I is more of a privileged pride I, full of ahankar perhaps. Tum kon ho? Main, main, main hu. That's the one that's being used there. I am I. You don't know who I am, right? So that I is being, that narcissistic I is being projected here. So I am I. Anywhere and everywhere, I see the one who calls himself I in this world. He is tightly packed like the sword in its sheath. It is I. Here, there could be multiple meanings in the closing para, closing stanza, that is, I'm sorry. Uh, there could be multiple meanings. 
primarily it, it appears to be a, def, a de depiction of the eye as in the eye male but it, go, it could also be the eye female in Kamala Das who is lonely and gets into a personal space it could be both but based on your blocks and based on the reviews it is I who drink lonely drinks at 12 midnight in hotels of strange towns it is I who laugh it is I who make love and then feel shame it is I who lie dying with a rattle in my throat. The male, the man, the privileged who can walk at midnight anywhere, drink at 12 in strange hotels in strange towns. The man who can laugh louder. The man who can make love with anyone he or she wants to and then feel guilt. I am sinner. I am saint right i have slept with many women but i'm saint again i get reminded of this famous statement by henry fielding who wrote tom john's prescribed to you in mg3 in order to glorify tom john's love for his lady i forgot her name right now uh sophia i suppose in order to justify tom john's love for sophia at a mid part of the novel Henry Fielding intervenes and says, because by then Tom Jones has been with a lot of ladies. So uh, Henry Fielding intervenes and says, Tom is an innocent guy, innocent guy. He may fall for the charms of women. And if and when they request and entice him, he sleeps with them. You know, he doesn't know to refuse. So out of sheer love, he sleeps with all of them. But that doesn't mean he doesn't love Sophia. Sophia is so dear to him and he's so true in his love, says Henry Field. Though whenever I read this, I find this really difficult for me to comprehend that sort of innocent, genuine love. I don't know. But then that's what Madhavi Kuti is referring to. I slept with many, but then I am the sinner, but I am the saint because I am a man. If you are a woman, then you are a sinner, you are a slut, you are whatever you are. That's how slut shaming happens. So being a man, I can drink lonely and drink at 12 midnight in hotels of strange towns. I can laugh out loud. I can make love, feel guilty. And I am the sinner and I am the saint. I am the beloved and betrayed. I have no joys that are not yours. No aches which are not yours. I too call myself I. See, so that's where the mood changes. Maybe it changes from here. That's disputable, but nonetheless, she says, Das or any man who's a stereotypical one, you may be doing all these things, but I am the beloved and I am the betrayed. You have betrayed my love. I have no joys that are not yours, no aches which are not yours. And I too call myself. I and that I is somehow probably less powerful than the I that you use because you are a male and I am a woman. So that's how an introduction goes. When it comes to questions, annotations apart, I've shown you two or three occurrences which have been repetitive when it comes to annotations from this poem. But apart from that, there could be questions regarding how uh, the language is being employed in this poem. You could also draw from this poem for writing an essay in any of the novels. If a question comes in how uh, Mulkraj Anand or Salman Rushdie uses Indian English to good effect in their novel, you could definitely bring in Kamala Das and her poem and introduction in order to explain how these writers have taken their own Indian English to better heights. Let's quickly move on because we only have another 20 minutes perhaps. Let's quickly move on to another poem by her titled The Sunshine Cat. So apart from the language aspect, an introduction also has a gender conundrum. It also has a personalized confessional tone that's to be noted. And uh, this is heightened in the next poem, The Sunshine Cat. Would someone please do the honors of reading this poem? I can share the link with you in the group, in the chat, that is, I'm sorry. Just give me a second.
let me share the link yes bhavna ji you may feel free to read uh let me share the link uh, let me let me sh just share the screen once again the link has been shared let me just share the poem yeah go on this is a smaller poem this doesn't have too much it's comparatively small 22 lines they did this to her the man who knew her the man she loved who loved her not enough being selfish and a coward the husband who neither loved her nor used her but for the was a ruthless watcher and the band of cynics she turned to clinging to their chest where new hair sprouted like great winged moths borrowing her face into their smells and their young lust to forget to forgot how to forget to forget oh to forget and they said each of them i do not love i cannot love it is not in my nature to love but i can be kind to you they let her slide from pegs of sanity into a bed made soft with tears and she lay there weeping for sleep had lost its use i shall build walls with tears she said walls to shut me in surinder kaur ji okay sir yeah her husband shut her in every morning looked her in a room of books with a streak of sunshine lying near the door like a yellow cat to keep her company but soon winter came and one day while locking her in he noticed that the cat of sunshine was only a line a hair thin line a hair thin line and in the evening when he returned to take her out she was cold she was a cold and half dead woman now of no use at all to men thank you sir thank you thank you so that's just one blind reading of those 22 lines once again congratulations and thank you to both of you let's continue there could be further crashes as well because it's raining outside it's summer rain happening outside so that might be a possible reason why the network crashed so please don't go away just in case my internet connection fails i'll come back and continue from where we left so i was trying to tell you that well what is it that i was trying to tell you yeah so when you try to recite poems in particular uh, give yourself a few seconds by going through those lines and give life to what you recite because that's what makes it interesting so when it comes to this particular poem by kamla das yes congratulations to both of you on your wonderful recitation and that's also because you're just taking baby steps in this but uh, there could be better renditions in the sense um just give me a second yeah share this time okay so when you when you read this poem look at the pervading mood it is again about the marital discord about how the wife has been neglected by the husband or how the age gap is playing a major role uh, in the particular poem so how would you read this how do you read that first line they did this to her the men who knew her the man she loved who loved her not enough being selfish and a coward how do you read this there is a sort of an exclamation or let's say a sort of a disgust in this they did this to her they who they did this to her avara download cheyidu unhone ye un pe kiya they did this to her who are this day the men who know her the man she loved who loved her not enough being selfish and a coward the husband who neither loved nor used her but was a ruthless watcher and the band of cynics she turned to clinging to their chests when new hair sprouted like great winged moths borrowing her face into smells and the young lusts to forget to forget see how do you read that to forget to forget or to forget and they said each of them i do not love i cannot love it is not in my nature to love but i can be kind to you 
they let her slide from pecks of sanity into a bed made with soft tears and she lay there weeping for sleep had lost its use i shall build walls with tears she said walls to shut me in her husband shut her in every morning locked her in a room of books with a streak of sunshine lying near the door like a yellow cat to keep her company but soon winter came and one day while locking her in she noticed that the cat of sunshine was only a line a half thin line and in the evening when he returned to take her out she was a cold and half dead woman now of no use to all men at all to men so look how this poem proceeds right from the beginning something similar to an introduction she speaks about how she longed for love how she was willing to love and to be loved and how men were passive and abusive and utilitarian with her how she was you know looking for a ptolemic love or for a mind related love and how they were all physical with her so look at her helplessness look at the pity from which she writes this poem they did this to her they did what to her and who are the state explained one after the other the men who know her the man she loved who loved her not enough right she loved the man he did not love her enough being selfish and a coward being selfish and a coward maybe reference to an adolescent love she loved someone but then he didn't love her as much as she loved he was a coward he was a coward maybe he didn't want this to be public he didn't want to go you know public about the fact that they are in a relationship he was being selfish and a coward selfish maybe thinking about a better life maybe thinking about his personal image or whatever there is a latter reference to which i shall come back the husband who neither loved nor used her but was a ruthless watcher das is being referred to here das who neither loved nor used her because there was a wide gulf of age difference there was a huge age difference between kamala and das so he neither loved her nor was he really cruel to her but he was a ruthless watcher and the band of cynics she turned to cynics a person who is motivated purely by self interest selfish people so the selfish people whom she turned to clinging to their chests burrowing her face into their smells now just imagine the word image nalla romavrudamaya mar a maril murka pidikkunna snehathinu vendi kodikkunna kamala suriya right so a, a chest full of hairs and she is clinging on to them in quest of affections burrowing her face into the smell into the what do you call into the uh, wear yeah the sweat into the sweat smells and they young lusts to forget okay? they young lusts because they were lusting after her when she was looking for love to forget to forget or oh, to forget to forget what to forget all these betrayals and they said each of them not one not two but each of those cynics they said i do not love i cannot love it is not in my nature to love but i can be kind to you right go back to the first one the selfish and coward lover somewhat like that i do not love i cannot love it is not in my nature to love they let her slide from pegs of sanity into a bed made soft with tears and she lay there weeping for sleep had lost its use 
sleep had lost its use by their constant abuse so the way they were using her the way they were abusing her the way they they were subjugating her the day the way they were abandoning her out of misery out of heartbreak out of the mishap of breakups her bed had become soft wet with her tears karanje 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 a kedaka muluvan avalde kanneer kondu vidarnu ivar itrayam peru parthi sanchadichena bhagamayittu she started to weep and the bed became soft and she lost or she let her slide they let her slide from pegs of sanity so what happens when you move from sanity you became insane remember that was referred to in an introduction schizophrenia maniac right so pegs of sanity she was out of her mind she lost her sanity suffering these many heartbreaks suffering these many promises being broken she lost her sanity and they let her lose her sanity they stood apart nonchalantly without commitment and they were like i'm sorry i can't help you they brushed aside her queries so she lay there weeping in her bed for sleep had lost its use right out of the miseries that she was going through crying 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 sleep had abandoned her the only sleep that she could crave for was the eternal sleep death so sleep had abandoned her i shall build walls with tears she said walls to shut me in in a way walls would protect you right so i'll build walls with my tears so that nobody else gets into me and breaks my heart further her husband shut her in every morning not in the walls but in her room locked her in a room of books with a streak of sunshine lying near the door like a yellow cat to keep her company so her husband shut her in the room every morning locked her there and went for work so a room full of books with a little bit of sunshine falling into it just as if a cat is there to keep her company but soon winter came and when there is winter there is no sunshine it's all dark so one day while locking her in he noticed the husband noticed that the cat of sunshine was only a line a half thin line that is the light has waned and in the evening when he returned to take her out she was a cold and half dead woman now of no use to, at all to men now look at the comparisons there are quite a lot of things going on there literally change of seasons summer to winter sunshine to cold the line has become thin but here the line is also about hope or of companionship or of love you know the, the line has become thin and uh, by the time he returned to take her out she was a cold and half dead woman cold due to winter cold because of the lack of love affection compare companionship taking care of compassion blah 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 whatever so she was a half dead woman now of no use at all to men you may also think of herself as a fragile woman without proper food crying all day long locked up in a room become so thin that men who look for fleshly affairs would no longer be interested in her appearance that could also be an intention uh, in those lines so the poet ends with that pathetic pathos note that i am of no use to any men at all men who were always after my flesh when i was in quest for that eternal love and that's how that poem ends due to the lack of time i'm not going to deal with my grandmother's house today or maybe later either but i could just talk to you very briefly about that poem my grandmother's house is completely autobiographical in nature madhavi kutti having lost her grandmother that is balamani amma pays a visit to her ancestral home in nalapat the nalapat house and as she pays a visit to her ancestral house memories of her grandmother abounds in her mind and she discusses them with us the nostalgia the longing how the home has become a place for reptiles that is snakes and so on and so forth so that is something 
that that poor deals with and if you are able to understand this much the annotations or any other question from that poem would not be that difficult to deal with it could be anything that you want to say if you have nothing to say just feel free to open up and share something with your friends even that is fine because we are all a family extended family even though we meet online and even though we have a fourth wall between us it doesn't really matter we are still the literature mag7 family from ignorance just a two uh, me, yes arya please uh, well i would like to thank you for putting in your thoughts about uh, tom jones and uh, the quotes by henry fielding because uh, while i was preparing that particular um, novel for uh, mg uh, even i couldn't relate with what how uh, fielding was trying to justify tom's character and i was like uh, am i thinking it the wrong way or something wrong with me and i they, there was nothing that i could discuss with anyone and um, all the youtube channels also they just give the story there's no opinion and it it was kind of reassuring that when you uh, voice my thoughts it was good because uh, there's no way we can justify tom jones and while i was preparing that particular novel i am still wondering how can it be considered as one of the best novels in english literature maybe it's because of the part of the world that we come from and uh, that we cannot uh, relate to it but still i felt good that at least i could uh, you could uh, speak out my mind thank you arya thank you for that uh, honest feedback even though we are discussing mg7 because arya pointed out this particular thing allow me a couple of minutes to talk about the origin of novel and uh, a little bit of further discussions on what arya said uh, what i told is not actually completely true okay i'll come to that a little while later tom jones can be justified in terms of fielding or the rise of the novel i'll come back to that a little while later but then to get started with because arya said the story is unconvincing to you let me give you a better story much before henry fielding and tom jones in 1740 a person called samuel richardson wrote what is now regarded as the first modern english novel the novel is titled pamela p a m e l a pamela i'll give you a one sentence plot of pamela in pamela you have a maid who take care who takes care of a lord's mother and the mother passes away and the lord tries to make sexual advances towards her he literally tries to molest her malayalam thi parayanengil oru veetu jolikari aayittulla oru cherupakari oru amme oru prabhuvinte amme nokkam vanna jolikari amma marane petta shesham aa veetile nivarthi illada todruge ee prabhu ayale manabanga padutan shramikkum cheyyu don't worry those are those who are from north india i was just trying to recreate the same in malayalam okay i've already told you what it is so despite those attempts of molestation by the time the novel comes to the end pamela consents to marry the lord i repeat the maid who was attempted in molestation by the master consents to wed him to to marry him by the time the novel comes to a closure there are quite a lot of such stories which would not sound sensible to us at least from a uh, progressive outlook but then let me give you one other alternate point of view to you arya the reason why henry fielding justifies tom jones and his actions is because up until henry fielding's time in britain the society nurtured a popular view that people and their character is defined by their birth in india we have this caste system people used to believe that if you belong to a particular caste you are noble and good and whatever mischief you do can be forgiven and if you belong to a certain caste then you would have done all the mischiefs similarly in britain they had this concept that people of a noble parentage the son of a king the son of a lord the son of a priest would all be good people and bastards or people who belong to low class would always be thieves burglars robbers good for nothing fellows and so on rapists and so on 
So Tom Jones or Henry Fielding wanted to break this perception through his novels. So in order to do that, he brings in a bastard child. And the, the subtitle of the novel Tom Jones is a foundling, F-O-U-N-D-L-I-N-G. Foundling in Malayalam is Kandigittiyaguti. Or totally karnagittanada, Tom Jones. So Tom Jones as a novel begins as found in Square Alvothi's uh, room in a, what do you call, cradle. So he's found in the cradle. That's why it's foundling. Just like we say duckling, right? So he's found and nobody knows who his father is until like the latter part of the novel. So Tom Jones is a bastard. And there are people who are of noble parentage, for instance, like Bliffil, B-L-I-F-I-L. So Bliffil is all mischievous. Despite being of a noble parenthood, Bliffil is a villain, an anti-hero. So Fielding wants to portray that people with good parentage can be vicious and people with you know a bastardly appearance or from a low life can be good. Throughout Tom Jones, you could see Partridge, for instance. He is just a, a layman, but then Partridge is very good by nature. So there are quite a lot of characters who are commoners, who are good, and uh, you know uh, high class people who are terrible or miserable. Uh, again, a paradox in that is Henry Fielding tries to portray Tom Jones as inherently good by saying he is a bastard. But by the time he ends the novel, Tom Jones belongs to Square Alvothi's family. So he's still playing along the British standards because if I'm a stereotypical British reader, I would, after all the disagreements that I've had throughout the novel, at the end I would say, yeah, Tom is after all belonging to this particular community. So he will definitely be good. So that's where Henry Fielding messes it up entirely at the end. Padikil kondu kalodakya na karamda malalati pare. Anadhe Tom Jones in the climax in the kondu vita. Henry Fielding said they could. And then Adu there, bastardly child and the Varnu Dr. Tausana Melbo, may many little women in the movie in the Rainer Eddy like Fielding and Angle Gordon the British Tiki. Okay, thank you so much, Adi. That is quite thought provoking. Anybody thank else? Thank you for your, your inputs in on this, sir. Thank you so much. Yeah, I, I also deal with MEG3. I'm not sure if the center would have a session. If we do get a session, I'll be happy to share this elaborately with you at a later point of time. Yes, Shreya, I could see your hands raised. Uh, yeah, I just wa it was not clear what you talked about uh, women and politics. Could you just elaborate that point a bit more from introduction? Uh, I was talking about how Kamala, I mean, what are the themes that comes abound in Kamala Das writings? So women and not the politics as in, uh, you know, the Congress BJP thing, but politics as in gender politics how women are subjugated and how patriarchy tries to condition and subjugate women. So that is predominant. Uh, uh, no, no, not the gender politics part. I meant like uh, you were talking about this point where um, nobody associates uh, women with politics, right? Oh, yeah. The, the privilege the opening, part. The opening, the opening line of the poem. So yeah. that is again, that's a part where Kamala Das tries to say that the moment, even though I'm a political, even though I am not involved with politics, the moment I say politics, the names that come to my mind are of men. Nehru, for example. But I can give you any number of men. Currently, I can talk to you about Pendrai Vijay. Or I can talk to you about Narendra Modi. Or I can talk to you about V. Murli Dharan. Or I can talk to you about Rahul Gandhi. Yes, in the contemporary politics, we could still say Sonia Gandhi, Priyanka Gandhi, or this um, teacher Amma, and so on and so forth. But then uh, Kamala Dhan says that back in those days, when she thinks about leaders, they are all men. And it's not because women cannot be leaders or women don't want to be leaders, but it's because of the power politics that they uh, engage in. You may be aware that until recently, uh, parliament didn't have sufficient amount of equality in terms of women representation. It is when 33 percentage of uh, that women representation was uh, passed that it got comparatively better. Okay, Surinderji, I could see your hand raised. Okay, Shreya, go on. I could see your hand raised again. Uh, uh, the part is not clear. Okay, that you spoke about the actual participation. I was I was trying to ask whether is there a gender is there a barrier coming up in the thought? She's actually just uh, she knows all the names. But nobody associates the talk of politics with women. So yeah, precisely. the thought is, yeah. uh, uh, is a privilege of men. You used a word there. I did not uh, catch that 
that time. That's oh, why I, I'm so I'm so sorry. I don't remember that either. But that I what I privilege you said, but uh, I did not. I missed that word. That's why I was trying to ask. Okay, that doesn't matter. So this is exactly what I meant. That is, uh, in that poem later also, this male dominance and the conditioning comes up. Now, so that's what she was referring to when uh, right from everything, personal is political, and you try to dominate us and subjugate us. That's the one line of all that.